everybody, welcome to Board Game Breakfast, the best board game variety show that there is. I'm your guest host today, Brian Drake, and this episode is sponsored by Pandasaurus and their game Godspeed. Godspeed's a mid-weight worker placement game in which it's about extraterrestrial colonization where you play as one of five nations, whether it be the U.S. or India, the Soviet Union, Japan, or the European nations. The theme is that the space race was a lie and that it was just a cover-up to discover a new planet which you are racing to colonize to get his resources. So, thanks to Pandasaurus and Godspeed for sponsoring this episode. And do we have an excellent episode? Of course we do. We always do. Our contributors have some amazing segments ready to go for you. So, I say without further ado, let's dive in and have some board game breakfast together. So last time I did a board game breakfast in this segment of things I found on the internet, I did an illusion where I swallowed needles. Some people were like, that's gross at 9.30 in the morning when I'm trying to eat my grapefruit and watch this. So I am going to do another illusion. That's what I'm here for. That's what I do, right? But instead of doing that one, I'm going to have one that's related a little bit more to board gaming. Now, if you are playing a game and your entire strategy is built on, man, I need this card to pop up in the deck. Looking at you, BJ and Everdell. Uh, I need this card to pop up. I need it. Where is this card? Why isn't it showing up? Maybe you're playing Marvel Champions. Maybe you're playing uh, Arkham Heart of the Card Game. Maybe you're playing any assortment of card game where you're like, man, I really need this card to happen so I can get this combo going. Wouldn't it be great if you could do something to force that card to come a little faster when you need it instead of, you know, having to wait. But you don't want to touch it and, dis and disrupt it and mess it up. That's cheating. So we do a little something like this. So there you go. Have a little bit of fun with that. Try it yourself, maybe. Uh, let me know how it goes, but uh, just wanted to bring in this section, since I'm doing it, I'm the guest host, a little bit of levity, a little bit of difference, a little bit of personal style and touch. So thanks for indulging and watching. Let's keep going with breakfast. Hi, Stella. And Tarrant here. We have a great two-player game. Well, not really. It's more than two players, but I like it two players. Cooperative game. Yeah. Nemo, Nemo Rising. Rising! Yay! Yep. So I attracted to it first because it's Nemo and we like Nemo's War. Yep, so uh, based of course on the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea novel. Wow, uh, you know novel. that. Yep. Very good. It is a cooperative game. We feel like at the start it's a little bit easy but then towards the end... Oh no! So we have to go around, um, monster will pop up and then chase us on the... Um, Around the board? Yeah, around the board. And we get to, we have to flip the, the tiles, the location tiles, mm -hmm. and then come back to our base. Yes. Yeah, and it's the, you don't, you don't appreciate it in the rules, but getting back home is the tough part of the game. Yes. Because you lose a lot of points when you run into monsters, and that's when monsters have swarmed the map. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a strange one. You'll, you'll finish the yes. objectives and you'll be like, cool. And then, yeah, then it's quite tough from that point forward. So that ex escalation is pretty like yeah. at the end, like, wow. Like we feel like, yeah. oh, we have an easy, but no, yeah. almost, almost dead. Like we just made it, I think, on our, on our game. Yeah, I think we, we were relatively close, yeah. Yes. It's a, it's a dice throwing co-op, so yeah. you'll be defeating monsters and tasks by trying to get symbols on dice, mm -hmm. uh, which you yes. know, we've seen that in Ghost Stories and a few other games like that. Yes, yes. You have ways to mitigate that by mm -hmm. drafting cards. Yep. So it balances all of that out relatively well in a yeah, decent yeah. level. I like the artwork as well, so check it out. Yep. Nemo's Rising. So thanks for watching. We are on the Dice Tower for how to play videos and pocket playthrough and Maple University on YouTube. Yep. See you next time. Yeah. I'm Starla. I'm it. And we are our Family Plays games. games. And today we're going to show you another one of our favorite family games. Point Salad by AEG. Yes. Point Salad. It's such a simple game and it's so cute. I mean, cute. who wouldn't like a game where you make a salad. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, I'm not a salad eater. No, I am. Yeah. I'm a salad I, eater. I don't like salads, but yeah. I don't mind playing with cards that look like salads. Yeah. Because look at this, the little carrots are so cute. I mean, who wouldn't love this? So it's really simple. 
you just draft cards mm -hmm. and you set collect. Yeah. Two simple mechanics. And all the, you know, the way you make point, you make points are just going by the cards that have, you know, what you need to do to get all the points. Get all the vegetables that you need, get points. And that's and about it's really it. Easy. It's a family game beyond family games because it takes up to six players, which is, yeah. hey, that's a family. And it's kind of a party game, too, yeah. because I know when we go out places, we actually went to a gaming store to have a game night. Uh, this was a few months back before everything, you know, happened with COVID-19. We played the game night. We had six people at the table. Mm -hmm. A lot of fun. Everybody laughed because it's so cute. You know, people are going to take some of the stuff that you want, and you want it to sit there till it's your turn, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So you sit here crying. <laughs> Your finger saying, Don't yeah. take the lettuce. With you didn't win, did you? No, yeah, you didn't I win. Didn't, okay, no. I didn't win. That's I, rare, you know. So, you're like, don't take that lettuce, yeah. but you know, if it goes, hopefully, another lettuce will come down, and, and that's just pretty much it. You, you you play, there's a little luck involved, you hope you get luck. the right card, good luck. Good luck. but other than that, you're gonna love it. It's a fun one, it's family. You don't it's have to like salad one. to like points. That's salad. true, that's true. So, guys, thanks so much. Yeah. And have a great breakfast, and we'll see you again soon. Bye, bye, -bye. everybody. So in today's segment of reviewing something not board game related, I wanted to talk about something rather timely when it comes to pop culture, and that would be Man of Steel and Batman v Superman, the extended cut. You say, Brian, how is that timely? Well, I don't know if you know this, but some of you probably already do, but it announced a couple weeks ago the Snyder Cut of Justice League is a real thing, and it's coming to HBO Max. Now, here's the interesting thing. Apparently... We've heard rumors and things milling about about the Snyder Cut, about what it actually is, but apparently it's a totally different film than Justice League finished by Joss Whedon. And when we say finished by, we pretty much mean redone by Joss Whedon. So, the reason I bring this up is I've been watching through Man of Steel and BVS, the extended cut, and they suffer for things that are not in their control. Now, here's what I'm talking about. I'm a huge DC apologist. You know what I'm saying? I love DC comics. Man of Steel is one of the top five superhero movies for me of all time, period. It's just amazing. Batman Superman came out, though, because the time period at which it came out was just an absolute nightmare for the tone that it was trying to bring. Now, if you watch the extended cut, the movie is solid. It holds up. It's in its own dark, gritty world, especially in a world after a movie like Joker comes out. We're in this dark, gritty world that Snyder's telling the story in, but it came out around the same time as Deadpool, and right as the Infinity Gauntlet series or the Infinity uh, Saga was just wrapping up into this amazing ball and bow that we love, right? So timing hurt it severely, but... Um, also, you know, there were a couple flubs and errors and things like that in the theatrical cut. But if you watch the extended edition, you really get to figure out the nuance of scenes that didn't make a lot of sense in the uh, theatrical cut. So that's what I'm reviewing this week on reviewing things that aren't board game related would be Man of Steel. Solid, solid. One of the, no, sorry, the best musical score in a superhero movie. It's Hans Zimmer. Quite possibly the best musical score in movies to me. I love it. It's so good. That soundtrack is phenomenal. Just the way it's got the kind of like almost alien sounding music. Just really, really good. So um, that's Man of Steel. It's a solid movie. It's a good look. It's a good tone. It fits and plays well within its own rules that it sets. Even the controversial ending, I'm not going to tell you, but as the controversial ending, it makes sense in the rules that it sets up because instead of giving it an easy way out of let's go to the moon or let's do this or this, it's right there downtown and people are struggling and he's trying to fix the problem. That happens. So if you haven't seen Man of Steel, I highly recommend Man of Steel. And if you haven't seen Batman v Superman, now that we're past the Infinity Saga, all that's over. It was amazing. We loved it. Captain America was so great, especially when he says Hail Hydra and he's tricking him, you know. Love it, right? But we're past that now. Deadpool is long removed. The silly kind of slapstick uh, superhero stuff is kind of cooling down. And we're back to a world where Joker is very popular and we're back in this grittier feel. Go back and watch Batman v Superman, the extended cut, the thea not the theatrical cut, and let me know if you're needle has changed for the better or for the worse or if it's basically stayed the same i don't i don't i'm not a rotten tomatoes guy i think that's that's so subjective the number and all that sort of stuff it comes from a, it's an aggregate of course but I, I don't let that influence my opinion of a movie so if you enjoy man of steel let me know if you enjoy batman v superman let me know if you didn't enjoy either of these uh and don't say martha so <laughs> okay.
kidding. Sure, that's a sore spot for a lot of people, but the movie holds up uh, for a lot of other reasons. So that is the review for things on the internet that aren't uh, board game related uh, as we look forward to the Snyder Cut of Justice League. Hi, everybody. Hello, we are Ryan and Bethany. From Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. All right, well, today we're going to be talking about Oh My Goods. Uh, but before we do that, Oh My Goodness. Uh, <laughs> over the past couple of months, I have gone kind of backwards in my weight loss. I kind of picked up the quarantine 15, as it were. Uh, but you know what? I've also, uh, in the past 10 days, lost 15 pounds. <laughs> so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, it's just a lot of the good things have been happening for my mental health lately, and that helps me kind of stay on the ball with my physical health. So, excited about that. Let's talk about Oh My Goods. This is just a simple card game, right? There's not a whole lot going on there, but there's a whole lot going on in here. Uh, it uses multi-use cards. It's kind of an engine-building game. The cards can become goods. They can become resources. They can become buildings. They're even kind of a, kind of a timer that progresses through the game. Yeah, I really like the multi-use cards. I just like that mechanism. Yeah, that's right. And in a game, I think it's really, really fun. Another thing I like about this game is that even though sometimes it feels like you're not doing anything and you're choosing the wrong building to work in and you're just really frustrated, at the end of the game, your scores are really comparable to each other. So I feel like that's a good sign that the game is still competitive, even if you have a bad round or two. I will say that as much fun as this game is, and as simple as it seems... It was kind of still a hard game to learn from the rule book, even though it was a small rule book. Yeah. And it was also kind of a hard way, hard game to teach. I felt like I had a, a struggle through teaching it. We needed you, Melissa. We needed yeah, you. Yeah, we needed you to help teach the teach so I could have <laughs> teach it better. It was really weird. Like I don't I don't I don't even know if it's like our fault or the game's fault, but for some reason I had a hard time learning it and Ryan had a hard time teaching it. It was just I don't know. It was weird. But outside of that, we had a lot of fun. Yeah. This is a whole lot of engine building. There's a lot of complexity uh, in a really small package and a really small price point. So we recommend if you want some bang for your buck, yeah. this is it. If you want to hear our full thoughts, go ahead and find us on YouTube under Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Or you can follow us on Facebook under Ryan and Bethany Board Game Reviews. Well, everybody, this is Ryan and Bethany. Hoping you have a happy, healthy breakfast. <laughs> Bye, Bye, everybody. Guys. We are totally trash. Okay, well, let's not panic. Wait, why are those my chits over there? Oh no, no, those are my chits and your chits touching. Oh yuck, that's so gross. Is that my player aid sticking out of the Xbox? I, I, I think I'm gonna be sick. <laughs> <laughs> are those my score markers in that juice glass? <laughs> oh no, I can't tell which houses are mine. Hey, look at that. Catan and Orleans just got toddler. Mm, what's going on? Oh, wow. Oh. Oh, that really rolls my dice. Gosh, it's so bad. Looks like Tom Vassell was here and just did a review. <laughs> the chits to oh my yeah, the chits are touching. The the chits are touching. That's that that is gross. That is gross. Looks like the gamers kiddo had a catantrum, huh? <laughs> Funny, right? Dude. Maybe they'll stop complaining that they don't get played enough. <laughs> Be careful what you wish for, right? Be careful what you wish for. Is that my rule book hanging from the fan? <laughs> oh, what a mess that was. You wouldn't believe where I found this guy. <laughs> Yuck. Where do you think she found it? You don't want to know. <laughs>
everyone. We're going to take a break here and talk real quickly to Martin from Awakened Realms. And man, Awakened Realms is just a company to be reckoned with right now with a major Kickstarter going on for Nemesis Lockdown. Uh, welcome to the show. Hello, everyone. Hello, Tom. So this is this is interesting that your company has really had some major growth to the point where this Kickstarter is already one of the largest Kickstarters of the year and doing really well. Were you surprised at the reaction to Nemesis, uh, how it's, I would think, the, been the most popular of all your games? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like starting the campaign, I had no idea what to suspect because this was the first time uh, we were like redoing, a, maybe all, the other one was DH Downfall, but as you said, that's just like the one versus one uh, player market is much smaller than the uh, like the up to four players. Uh, but basically, no idea what to expect because on one hand, I think that the uh, the demand for the game was quite high uh, and there was no too much supply because of like a lot of different factors. Uh, but basically, uh, a lot of people wanted to buy it, and it drives some eBay prices crazy. Up to you know, you needed to pay like three hundred dollars for core box, which I don't really am a huge fan of. I think I, I think that the game should be accessible uh, as much as possible. So you know, making a price triple or or four times the norm is is just you know counterproductive to being the game. So had zero idea what to expect, but you know, so many fans of Nemesis. I think that this is this is because the um, one thing that I always say uh, is like it, it's good to have uh, a different game that you don't have too much other to compare to. If you want the experience that Nemesis is offering, there is very little amount of games that will give you something similar with the, like maybe Battlestar Galactica or, or a few others, right? But uh, maybe that's why it's so popular. Well, the, yeah, it has some sort of secret sauce because a lot of times when a Kickstarter is very popular on Kick, very popular. People say, "Oh, it's because of the miniatures, etc." Mm. And they are fantastic miniatures. But as of us recording this, Nemesis is actually num ranked 33 out of 20,000 plus ranked games on Board Game Geek. Very, very high. So mm. that gameplay experience is there, and that doesn't happen to many Kickstarters. Uh, which which of those is actually more satisfying to see it ranked highly, or to see the number of people who who buy it and play it? Oh, I think that for me, the best time I have is reading the like, like game reports from people on Facebook when they tell all the crazy stories. Like every game has an amazing story, and that's what more satisfying to read than like the game we had where you know Z got two serious wounds at the start, and then he was able to make a comeback and actually be the only victorious. And there are so many stories like that. Like the guy gets first round queen out of the back, and just you know they need to deal with it for the other game. So that's, for me, this is the most fun, just seeing how much people are having fun uh, out of the game. Because this is, at the end of the game, the amount of fun you're having is the end goal. It's not, you know, super elegant design or whatever. It's like, how much fun are you giving to your, to your player base? When you put Awakened Realms together, was this something that you, a, a major focus point, the story? Because I see it in a lot of your games. Mm. So we have, like, three fillers that we think that are extremely important for board games. It's gameplay. Uh, which is uh, the biggest, the most important one. Then the other film is always story, whether it is like in your face story, like Tainted Grail with just a lot of story or just thematic experience and the world building through gameplay. And the third filler is aesthetics, meaning the miniatures, the art and everything. When you have all those three, you can get like a really great product. Without any of the one you get like, you know, it can be still a great game, but you know, without a cool thematic feel to it, it's kind of lackluster. Without a cool graphic to it, it doesn't have this appeal or marketing appeal. So now the your games have different themes. You have fantasy themes. You've gone into Camelot, and this one here yeah. is in outer space. The mm. the theme that we see many movies made about and such. Did did that have a lot of effect? Like, did you think about these movies when you were putting this game together? Sure. Uh, yeah, we got like a lot of inspiration from the sci-fi horror genre. This is like a very Cool genre. Like when we were growing up, there were all those all amazing movies like Alien, even Horizon, and those amazing horror stories. And certainly, they had a huge influence on 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 us uh, developing the game. And we were trying to then impose some other 
different uh, intrude like uh, aliens like for example you had the carnivores which is more like a dead space inspired and stuff like that so you have like all those there are like a lot of tropes in the this genre and we try to exploit a lot of them so this is like a kind of a system where you can have a horror on the ship with like mind uh, like enemies that will manipulate your mind or like zombie like or like alien like or like for example uh, right now you can have like a special base on, on the Mars so there's like a lot of different things yeah. and for those of you watching this if you don't know like I said the uh, basically Nemesis Lockdown which is a standalone uh, expansion which means you don't need the original game to play it yeah. in fact you could even get just the original game if you want to and this uh, Kickstarter is going on, and we'll have a link in the description below. So before we hang off uh, here, uh, Martin, is there anything you want to say about this new standalone expansion? Um, I think that this uh, it brings you to the point where, where there's like a lot of fresh ideas for people who are experienced with Nemesis, and there's like a lot of certainly like meta games, things that you can do, and we try to with like a lot of cool interaction points where the players will have to share the knowledge or try to get the knowledge from outside. So like it gets a lot of uh, dynamics above the above the table talking and trying to you know get the information from other and stuff like that. So we have like a lot of fun designing it and testing it. So I hope you guys also enjoy it once you will uh, get to play it. And if you're wondering how it plays on the Dice Tower channel itself last week, we put up a video of us playing through it, and you'll have to go. Well, he, Martin, spoiled a little bit about what happened there, but you'll have to go and see. It was a very <laughs> exciting sorry. finish, and somebody should have won, but it, it doesn't matter. So, thank you, Martin, for coming on the show, and let's thank keep you moving. Very much. All right. What's up, everyone? My name is Melissa McCack, and this is Smashing Buttons and Slamming Cards. This is a segment where I talk about a video game I love, and I connect it to a board game I love. And this week, I want to talk about Robin Hood, Defender of the Crown. I feel like this is a pretty underrated video game for some reason, but it was pretty much like an area control uh, thing, and you're playing in the Robin Hood lore and everything, and you're going through and you're trying to beat Prince John and his evil schemes and everything. But it's kind of like this all-out war-style game with a whole bunch of different mini-games built into it where you could go on raids and sword fights and tournaments and all that stuff. So I want to connect that to Shadows Over Camelot. This game is unfortunately out of print. I've come to realize that. And either way, it kind of sucks that it's out of print. But the game is really, really cool. It, it, it's got a trader mechanic in it. And I wanted to connect it to Robin Hood because... It sort of takes place in this like medieval time, both of these themes, I guess. And just like in Robin Hood, Shadows also has this, I guess, like war looming over you, but it's comprised of a bunch of different mini games that you've got going on between uh, going to the Grails and trying to discard Grails. You're trying to uh, attack siege engines and uh, get the, the, the sword and everything like that. Uh, Excalibur, I couldn't think of the name. And uh, it's got that traitor mechanic, which is very, very cool, where, you know, somebody is going to betray you, possibly. Uh, I love this game. I loved Robin Hood growing up, although I'm pretty sure Robin Hood was impossible to beat. Anyway, that's it for this week. If you'd like, you can check out mine and my brother's channel called Room 51. We are also streaming live on Twitch uh, and all that good stuff. I'll catch you next time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, as always, it's a chock full week, full of reviews, full of fun events and things that are happening here on the Dice Tower, live shows and everything uh, that you know and love. That's why you're here. That's why you're watching Breakfast. But also, we have the Summer Spectacular and the Virtual Con coming up. Do not miss these. They're going to be absolutely awesome virtual digital con experiences so that even though you're at home, you're still getting to enjoy all of your friends and your, your the fun excitement of board gaming with the community and the hobby that you love. But the cool thing is, the implementation of the new technologies to where you can find your friends, play a game with your friends, whether it be Tabletopia or Tabletop Simulator or one of the other options, whether it's an app, and do it as if you're at a con, really talking back and forth through chat and having fun, ribbing each other and joking with each other. So those two are going to be great, as well as the Summer Spectacular here on the Dice Tower in which there's just going to be streaming great, great content, just constant, non-stop, back to back to back, exciting, exciting content with guests, great 
great guest that you're going to love to see. So make sure you check out and support the Summer Spectacular. It's going to be so, so much fun. Tom's going to be reviewing Godzilla and Godspeed, as well as High Rise and many more, of course. Also, they're going to be continuing the 10,000 and Below series, and uh, as well as the What's Happening show that's been going on. So, a lot of stuff to look forward to this week on the Dice Tower. Let's keep on trucking along with breakfast. Hi everyone, it's Lexi from All Aboard Gamer and welcome to Perfect Pairings. Today we're going to make chicken marsala. Take your chicken breast and use the flat side of a meat mallet and pound it till it's about a quarter of an inch thick. I season this with salt and pepper. We're just going to dredge it and saute it in there for about five minutes per side. And we'll just throw it in our pan. The key is to not overcrowd the pan. Frying, we can go ahead and Start slicing our mushrooms. As soon as you take that last chicken breast out, you can put in all of your mushrooms, all your sliced mushrooms directly in that oil and cook them until they've reduced in size and all the water's out. So we're going to add half a cup of Marsala wine, sweet Marsala wine. All right, the alcohol is kind of boiled off now. So I'm going, to, I'm going to add half a cup of chicken stock, two tablespoons of butter. Stir this around. Once the butter melts completely, add the chicken back in and heat it through, then it's ready to serve. And we think it pairs well with viticulture. All right, so that was a another fine meal. You've mm -hmm. made you've made chicken marsala before. Yes. And uh, you wanted to pair it with viticulture. viticulture. How come? Well, because <laughs> it's a wine dish and viticulture is all about producing wine and t caring for your vineyards and uh, building up your, your farm and taking people on tours and it's just a quaint Tuscan village and yeah I love it yeah we thought this was a, a good pairing it's a great game it's gonna stay in our collection for sure oh, for sure one of With, my favorites top five yeah. all right folks so that's going to do it for this dice tower edition of perfect pairings if you want to see the full episode head on over to our channel and enjoy, enjoy your, your breakfast, breakfast. So in a traditional draft, players would go player one, player two, player three, player four. Player one, player two, player three, player four. Just like that. You go in order and then you restart the order. In a snake draft, what you're going to do is going to go in one direction and then wrap back around. So it's actually going to go player one, player two, player three, player four, player four, player three, player two, player one. This is most famous in Catan during setup where the players are going to in a snake draft order, place your starting settlements on the board. One, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. Hate drafting is when you are going to take a card during a draft. So usually in like a pick and pass kind of draft, we have a hand of cards. You're gonna take one and put it down and then pass your cards to the next player or maybe all the cards are on the table and you're, it's your turn to pick one of the cards up. A hate draft is when you are doing, you're taking a card that you don't necessarily want but you're stopping somebody else from taking. So in a game like Seven Wonders where the green cards are science cards and if you collect sets of them you're going to get a ton of points you might hate draft some of those science cards, even though they're gonna give you some points, you're gonna hate draft them because the person to your right needs all of, you know, one more gear card and they get a ton of points. You might take that one gear card because you don't want them to get it. That's a hate draft. That's it. All right, what's up? Welcome to the Brian Thinks section. Today, though, we have a special guest running in like a 1980s wrestler with a steel chair to my head, metaphorically. That would be, I didn't do that. No, she did not. Be Carla, the brains of our operation, to do the Carla and Brian Thinks segment all about two-player games, but not two-player games, lower count player games, lower player count games. So we have a little bit of a format for this. Now, you'll have to excuse Carla's voice for a little bit. She's uh, had surgery in the past, so she's a little bit It quiet. wasn't the past. It was like, real recent. That's true. The past makes it sound like it was six years ago. I mean, like six weeks ago, she had uh, surgery on her throat. So we are diving in today. Now, we could just tell you about two-player games, which we did the Battle Royale for that, but we're not going to do that. We're going to tell you about 
games, games that we like to play at two players because that's we'll, all we've got lately. Various, that's exactly right. We'll leave them on the table and play them a lot of times. So we're going to talk co-op first. The reason we're going to talk co-op first is we are not the king maker type of family here. Um, not a chance. Board gaming is good for our marriage in the sense that we're more of the regicide family. So when we're playing with a group, we will purposely chop each other's legs out from under them just out of pure spite. Like Game of Thrones? Game Sorry. Of Thrones. Oh, yeah. There's no ally in that or cosmic encounter. But two-player... I'm still salty about that. We're not talking about that. No. Two-player games. No. Games of the lower player count or two player count that have a higher player count. So let's start with co-op. What do you think the best? We can do it in order, it doesn't matter. Are you trying to ask me what the best higher player count game is that you can play with just two people? So I call her the brains of the operation right there, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes. So the first one we're gonna talk about is, of course, probably our favorite game just about of all time. Mansions, obviously. Mansions of Madness is second edition is a. But I feel like we kind of do it a little differently because we sometimes play with two characters. That's a good idea. Play with two characters, and you can control both. Uh, it's it's a good way to play out there. You can get more stuff. But Mansions is just such a good idea if you've got just two players, or you know, it, it's still fun no matter what the player count is. But it works really well if you can talk to the two of you uh, and get those kind of ideas worked out and hammered out. It's how we work on um, our marriage. Yes. <laughs> Mansions of Madness, marriage of madness. <laughs> no, that's, not that's not true. Um, <laughs> uh, my pick, though, in a similar vein, no app involved, is Seventh Con. Seventh Con is a great exploration game, all about. Uh, finding out how to beat these curses. But, um, my favorite because I haven't played it that much. But it's a really good one if you like adventuring and kind of exploring. And there's hidden things on the cards, and it's all done with cards, even though it looks like a board. So that would be my second choice or our second choice of cooperative games. Our third choice for cooperative games at two players is, of course, Pandemic. Legacy 2. Legacy. Well, Pandemic Legacy. Well, Legacy, but we're on to. We really enjoy Pandemic Legacy because we can just leave it on the table and just go. Mm -hmm. just doesn't we have a little kids, too, and they're pretty wild, so we try to just, like, shoo them away from <laughs> the table. Like cats, basically. Not. It's the same thing. Yeah. They're, <laughs> so, um, it's really good, though. It's a great cooperative game. Speaking of cats, let's go to our competitive games. That's a good point. Competitive games. And I have a feeling that there's going to be a cat involved. In the Isle of Cats. That is not on the list that we came up with earlier, but it's a great game that is actually really great at two players. It doesn't really suffer. Uh, the only thing that may suffer, quote unquote, would be the fact that less people are going to have public objectives and that's it. Fewer people. But also, fewer, <laughs> there are fewer tiles on the board. Look at that. Steel chair to the brain. There are fewer tiles to choose from, that's true. Fewer or less, I don't know. I'm never going to get it right, ever. Sand, you can't count sand. So I, I, said, I said Agricola right there. Fewer than them Agricola. Yeah, Alabama is showing. That's it. So, uh, Isle of Cats making a run in also to our fourth. Uh, my pick was The Colonist. I love this game. It's one of the best engine building strategy games. He likes games. it because he wins. I like it because I win, but it's actually one of the few games that rewards you for building an engine that you've been working on and it doesn't just end. The game lasts for about six hours, so we leave it out over a couple days and play. But it's played in three eras. So yeah. It's so, it's not, not just back and forth for six hours. It's era one. Era two, era three. And then like snake games, I don't like when there's... I you don't, don't like, like snakes, period. I don't period. like snakes, but <laughs> snake draft. Isle of Snakes. Oh, God. <laughs> don't do a sequel. No. Uh, what are we saying? Snake Snake drafting is a really great mechanic, though, because it's always your turn or it's never your turn. Right, and when you're playing... No, 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 no. That's what's wrong with them. Yeah, right, right, When you're sorry. playing with like four people in Grand Austria Hotel, it's either always your turn because you go back to back, <sighs> but most of the time, it's never your turn. Right. But when it's two players... It's always your turn. Yeah, just zooms back and forth back like and that. Forth. That's what I like about it. So, uh, one more quick one that we played recently is Tang Garden. This is a beautiful looking game. Uh, it'll be—I don't know if it's even out yet—but it's it's a beautiful looking game. Gorgeous from the top down, but also gorgeous if you lower your eyes and look. But it plays really well at two players because the strategy doesn't suffer at all. Mine doesn't. Okay, mine does. I've never won. Probably never will. But that sentence really brings us to the next point. It doesn't suffer at all, but some games that we love playing, my favorite game, for instance, does not do well. Even though it says 2 to 5, 2 to 6, 2 to 7, um, the, these games suffer for multiple reasons. Did you ever say what game you were talking about? Because you said, oh, my favorite well, no, we game. we have a list. But you didn't say what your favorite game was. Western Legends suffers horrendously at two players. It's almost, I know that they say you can do it with the man in black and stuff, and we've done that. I don't like it. It's not the same I'd thing. I'd rather play with five people. Mm -hmm. I want someone to try to rob me while I'm going gold mining, and then with the new pharaoh. Go ahead and try. I dare you. Won't work. Another type 
a segment of games that don't really work great in two players. Uh, bidding games, that's right. So things like uh, Raccoon Tycoon, they kind of suffer. They're great at a bigger player count. They kind of suffer at two players because you lose a little bit of interaction. Power Grid. The Power Grid is the worst example. The whole game is based pretty much on I actually on that. think it's the best example of being the worst. The best worst game on this list is Power Grid because you lose I mean, those it's options. Best, it's probably not a bad game. No, it's a great game, but Power Grid is a uh, lose option. But anyway, that's what we wanted to bring you today. Not a list of two-player games, but a list of lower count player games if you're trying to find some great strategy games that don't suffer at a lower player count because of uh, you may only have a low player count right now available to you. These like are some us. games. Like us, exactly. Go check these games out. They're fantastic. And let us know in the comments what your favorite lower player count high but what you said it earlier you know what we're talking about uh two player version of those games are in the comments below and thank you for letting us hang out with you for just a little bit on this breakfast now let's keep going this is a segment where we look at an ip driven game and we decide whether it fits the mechanism or not does it bring you into the universe and make you feel like it's the ip or is it simply a cash in today we're looking at wacky Razors from 1969 you're going to be playing two of the characters from the show, everybody will, and you'll be racing around the board. You're going to be rolling the dice and moving. You can use one character to move with both dice, or you can split the dice and move each person with one of the dice. There will be spots on the board where Dick Dastardly will be there, and if you land on that spot, you're going to lose a turn. If you land on another character, they have to go all the way back to the beginning. Your characters can be on the same space, and that's simply the rules. You're racing around the board and getting back. You do get the feel of wacky races. You're really racing on this. And when you're getting close to them, you're like, man, I'm five spaces away from mom. Rule of five, rule of five. Get some combination of five. And you always want to be sure because you're rolling two dice that you're not seven steps away from somebody. That's the most common way to get hit. You got Dick Dastardly out there doing things. It's a roll and move. It's a game from 1969, but it does fit the IP. Is it the best game in the market? Absolutely not, but it does fit the IP pretty well. It's not my favorite Wacky Races game, it's not my favorite racing game, it's not my favorite IP game, but the mechanisms and the IP do match. Hi guys, and welcome to the very last of a series of culling videos, and we're still Leaving it off with these three games here, starting off with Discoveries, The Journeys, or The Journals, Journals excuse me, Rainbow. of Lewis and his partner Clark. <laughs> his partner Clark. <laughs> you know what? When we first got it, I saw the cover and I was like, that's pretty. I love the pink in it, obviously. Um, but I hated the gameplay I, so much. I'm very disappointed that you hate it because I like this quite a bit. I know. And for that, I don't know if we should get rid of it. I think we are. We should at least play it once before we get rid of it. It's got dice allocation. And then as you use them, other people can actually grab them from you. Yeah. And um, and then, you know, you can get them back from them, obviously. But then you're trying to make these paths by turning in different symbols. And then you're journeying down the river and or mountains. We're journaling. <laughs> <laughs> And there's some interactions with the Native Americans and things. It's it's fairly simplistic as far as that goes. It's really just allocating symbols on your dice to the cards mm -hmm. and then doing things. Really, but it's a good one for dice. I don't dice. know I don't why know. I didn't connect with it. You know when you just like yeah. meld with the game and when you just don't? I don't know. Yeah. And we tried it a couple times. I'll try it one more time. I'll try it one more time. But yeah, we're, we're getting rid of it and maybe we'll play it one more time. Megaland. Uh, this is a pusher looking that you liked quite a bit. I loved it, honestly. And um, I was just like wiping the dust off of it. But it's we, been a little while. I have taught so many people this game and they all love it and I love it. What's the one that it's like now? Is that Space well, Boots or like what's the push your luck game? I mean, we have Quacks. So that's kind okay. of Okay. I just thought that was something that we got luck. that was maybe not. Okay. Yeah. I don't know what I'm talking about. But yeah, it's it's a uh, push your luck, and I love I love how it plays. I think it's super simple. You can literally teach anybody. You're like getting bonuses by buying cards. You can bring that into your hand and use those throughout going into this cave, and you can decide if you want in or out. Monsters will attack. You're ultimately trying to get a bunch of m money, and certain cards will generate those money. It's a, yeah. actually a really nice push like your luck it. game, kind of family weight. But we usually pick quacks when we got a push your luck game, so That's true. I don't know. I, do I don't like think it's it. gonna make it. Oh, here's another game. CV. That I hated. Um, I was not impressed with this. This is a very basic kind oh. of um, simulation, like a 
life simulation yes. kind of a game. Not yeah. simulation, but like a life builder. Didn't they, people call uh, compare it to Pursuit of Happiness? Yeah, Pursuit which is, like Pursuit of Happiness is quite a bit better than this. Um, this is very basic. It's it's kind of fun. It's it's all right. I, I know a lot of people really like this game. Yeah. It's super basic, and that's not why we don't like it. It's just, it just didn't click with us, and I don't think I would play this one again. So. I don't think. I think we played it one time, and I was so underwhelmed. I don't even really remember the gameplay. It didn't stick. It didn't stick. So, so wow. all three going farewell to the call videos yeah. and farewell to three out of three games yes. for us. Guys, thank you for sticking with the call videos with us we had a lot of fun doing it and uh, our collection is a lot more lean and uh what we want for us and mean lean and mean <laughs> all right we'll see you on the next something video something who knows that wraps up another amazing episode of board game breakfast here on the dice tower thank you to pandasaurus and godspeed for sponsoring this episode thank you contributors for the wonderful job you put in we will see you soon if you want to follow me on twitter instagram etc it's dice tower brian until next time we'll see you have a great rest of your day or if you're watching this at night sleep well i don't know endings <laughs> right thanks for watching board game breakfast tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with tom vassal and all the gang until next time i'm eric summerer and you've been watching board game breakfast a dice tower production